Perfect. Hello, Pyotr. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you so much for sitting down with me for this conversation about one of the most exciting trends in European tech right now. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start off and maybe talk a little bit about your founder journey and what was the idea behind Uncapped? How did you found the company? Yeah, great question. So um, prior to starting Uncapped, I was a VC and um, I met literally thousands of companies which were good businesses but didn't really fit the venture model. The VCs are looking for the unicorns, decacorns, but if you're building a good company which doesn't really have a potential to become this billion dollar business, you really struggle mm. to get funding, to re get any capital to grow your business. And they realized there must be a better way for these companies to scale. On top of this, a lot of founders were giving up all these shares, all this equity um, to, sp to get money, which they then spend on Google and Facebook. So, you know, this is what, uh, you know, gave me the idea for Uncapped, to create a new model for the companies to um, scale. And, you know, as long as they have positive in the economics, they should get debt funding, which allows them to scale without any dilution. Amazing. So talk me through a little bit what exactly you guys do. Um, yeah, tell me, if I were five years old, how would you explain to me what you guys do? Sure. So essentially, we are looking for the companies which have a proven business model and proven economics, and they know that for every pound, dollar, euro they spend, they can generate a bit more of, of returns. For these companies, we offer essentially unlimited capital, which they can spend on advertising, inventory, team, uh, to scale their business. They come to us, we connect to their data, and within a couple hours, we give them a funding offer, um, which they can then leverage and use to deploy the money and grow their business. Amazing. And, you know, what, what is the appeal of this kind of funding compared to going to a normal VC and raising equity? Absolutely. I think the key differentiation, differentiators between us and VC is, um, first of all, speed. As a founder, if you're fundraising, and you know, I've been through this on, many, on both sides, both as a VC and as a founder, several times. It takes months. It's, very dist it's a huge distraction. Uh, you're you know, preparing the materials, talking to funds, doing all the legal stuff, all the due diligence. You can't run the business for several months. Uh, it's actually a huge cost, a huge like, operational cost for a founder, uh, which we completely minimize. We don't expect any input from a founder other than just a couple clicks and a quick call with us. Uh, like, how, how does that like, form look like? How many questions is on the form? There is no form. There is no form. You come okay. to us, you give us access to your data, so we, we connect to your Stripe, PayPal, Shopify, we yep. accounting software to your Google, Facebook, a bank account, so just a couple clicks. We have a quick call to, with a founder to understand what are we looking for, and then same day, next day, we're getting a funding offer. That's all they have to do. Um, and you know, we don't take any equity, we don't take any warrants, any covenants, it's completely unsecured, and you know, they have complete freedom to, uh, to scale their business. So one thing is speed. Right. Another thing, what I said, is no dilution. Mm -hmm. I think today, you know, average founder at exit owns about 5% of a company. Like, wow. it's nothing, right? Like, as a founder, it's your baby. And giving up this baby is so painful. Um, and I think we want to enable founders to scale the business without giving up this equity. We have a crazy story of a company called Marshmallow. It was one of our first customers. They came to us where they were doing a two million round at a, like 10 million valuation. You know, we allowed them to get only one million of equity and we founded everything through the debt. Today, this company, two years later, is a unicorn. And with one million, we help them to save. Probably, you know, the founders managed to save tens of millions of, of, of equity for themselves. So this is a proposition we have to the founders, you know, like right. keep control, um, keep higher ownership of a business. Right. Can you talk me through a little bit more, um, you know, what are the conditions of the, the debt that you're giving to founders? And how does that potentially compare to other lenders that a, a founder might be able to access? Uh, our debt agreement is very, very simple. We, it's literally six pages long, and we have no covenant, um, nothing really crazy, there's no security, uh, don't take any, any, equi any equity. 
the only condition we have is we want to make sure that uh, you pay us back. Like, you know, we ask you to not do anything bad, don't take any other debt which could, you know, put us in a bad position. Right. But as long as you play fair by the rules, uh, this is a super, super simple, simple agreement for you. Okay, interesting. And what kind of companies, what's the right company, what kind of company do you want to work with? So 80% of our business is e-commerce companies, okay. uh, but we funded many other businesses too. We do work out of SaaS businesses, but at the end of the day, we can work with any tech-enabled tech business with a proven business model. What we are looking for is companies which really found their product market fit and they know they can scale. Our capital is to enhance them to get to the next level. No, we don't only provide them with capital. We have a whole team of VC partnerships, uh, you know, um, and other kind of partners, accelerators, uh, technology companies, who we can plug them into. We can help them fundraise. Um, we can we help them with strategic decisions. It's much more than just capital. Um, as you know, our vision is to become the next generation neo bank for startups. Yeah. Um, and today, if you, if you look back 50 years ago, the banks were very local. And yeah. every founder, there's no, no founders, there were entrepreneurs who were going to the local bank and they were getting funding there. They were talking to the bank manager and they were getting advice. They were getting, you know, just very personal relationship. Connections, yeah. Exactly. exactly yeah. We are now working to bring this back to the tech world. So we want to be the partner for every company from the moment they start their business to the IPO, where we'll give them the funding, we'll also give them the tools to scale their business, we'll give them the relationships, we'll give them the contacts, we'll give them the knowledge. Amazing. And so I guess that ties into my next question. My next question was going to be, you know, when a founder goes out and they think, okay, I, I want to kind of tap into this new kind of financing, and they compare you to your competitors, and as we were talking about backstage, there are many, which is a great thing for the ecosystem. You know, what, what do you think, how should they compare to compare you to your competitors and, and what do you think you have to offer? Um, I think a lot of... First of all, I truly believe we are the most founder-friendly uh, company on the market. Um, when we started to set up the terms of uh, our agreement, we made sure they are truly founder-friendly. This, this is the document by which we want to always stand by and make sure there is nothing founders should be scared of. I remember when we were drafting this agreement and you know, it took us so much time because the lawyers were coming up with agreement which was very tough to read, difficult to read, not understandable. And we're like, no, we want the founder to understand every single word in this agreement and really know what they're signing, for, signing up for. So you know, we don't have any clauses which many of our competitors have with any like covenants or early repayment fees or like forcing companies to repay early. We are truly the most founder-friendly company out of all of them. And maybe just to dig into that, because I feel like some of those words might be kind of intimidating or people yeah. might not be familiar with those terms. What are some of those, you know, maybe clauses or, or things that people should look out for or words that people should be looking for when they're reading some sort of an agreement? Sure. So, you know, some of our competitors are, for example, forcing some, forcing companies to have minimum marketing spend. Like, you know, you have, they have to spend X amount of money on marketing, otherwise you, the loan is defaulting. Or, you know, they're claiming it's revenue-based finance, where at the end of the day, there is a, like, long stop date, which means that, like, after six months, you have to repay a full loan, okay. which we don't have. Uh, there are some, you know, other covenants which force you, well, you have to have X amount of capital, uh, otherwise the loan is defaulting. We believe that when we understand the business, we don't need this, and um, we have no clauses of this kind in, in any other agreement. But this is only one part. I think the second part is how we work with the founders. I think, you know, when I speak to, speak to the founders, why they chose us over the competitors is we truly understand the companies. When we give them our uh, capital, we really analyze the business deeply and make sure we tailor the, the offering to the, to the business. This means we really have to understand you know, the payback period of the customer, you know, how are their cash flows operating, what are they looking for money for, uh, what's the risk of a, uh, of a profile. And we tailor this offering to the individual company. Mm -hmm. It's not one product fit all. Right. Um, it's custom made for, for every business. Mm -hmm. 
interesting. And how have you tweaked that product as you've scaled the business? Like, were there things that you kind of were surprised by or didn't expect to happen that have fed into how you've how you've built the business? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we're tweaking the product every day, and I think the biggest realization ca comes from talking to the customers and um, offering new. F like we started by you know offering a very standard product, and then over the time we realized that the clients want for, like have different needs. And for example, we have to allow the customers to not repay us for se several months early on because they have a very long sales cycle, right. and we have to tweak it. Or they need something more like not a simple loan, but the revolver line where they can draw on on which they can draw on every day. Or we have to make the loans much much longer because if our customers have business mm -hmm. and they their sales cycle is 12 months. We have to give them the loan, which will be like 12, 14, 15 months. Yeah. So, you know, every day we're working with a new client and tweaking products to them, but also we're launching a new product. So, next, next quarter, we're launching a completely new product where we allow the customers to tap into the funds they have on the payment processor much faster. Okay. Our Amazon, like, you know, there was a Black Friday last week, right? And a lot of our customers use Klarna. And it turns out that Klarna takes several weeks to pay them these funds. And it's a big working capital problem okay. to these businesses. So next quarter, we'll allow them to get these funds immediately. And so that's sort of something that you, you hear from your customers, you hear them struggling with this, and you're like, okay, how can we create something exactly. To, exactly. to help them? Interesting. And again, you know, revenue, you know, this sort of financing is really new. I feel like it's, you know, still a very small part of the market and a lot of founders are not familiar with it yet. What are some of the misconceptions that you hear from founders when they talk to you? Or Ooh, um, very good questions. Um, wow, uh, you really surprised me with this one. Um, I I think the biggest misconception is about um, that the price of a product. I think the truth mm -hmm. is it's very tailored to each of a customer, um, and really we want to make it work with our unit economics. I think some founders are sometimes worried about um, repaying our loan too early, right. uh, but you know we tailored our product now to make sure this will never happen uh, with a customer. Other founders are worried about how our product works with other debt providers. Right. But you know, at the end of the day, a lot of our customers are also taking venture debt, are taking any other debt funding, and these products are very mutually compatible. Yeah. A lot of founders are worried, well, if we use you, can we work with, can we take VC money? Right. Well, we actually work with every single VC fund in Europe, and like VC uh, VCs are actually the biggest source of clients to us because they really love the, custom, the startups to use our product because it allows their portfolio companies to scale faster without, dilution, without diluting both founders and funds. Interesting. And so what does that introduction like, flow look like? You know, the VCs just come to you and say, hey, maybe you should talk to this company. What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So VCs come to us and you know they reach out, hey Piotr or you know someone to my team, hey yeah. we have this amazing company. We really think they should accelerate, they should spend more money on marketing, they should, you know, hire more salespeople. And we really think, you know, they should do the round maybe in six, twelve months. But for now we want them to accelerate it. They should they should be using you. Um, we proactively reach out to the to the VC funds and build a relationship with them. Um, but also we introduce the companies to the VC funds because very often we see amazing companies and we're like, like hey guys, you're doing really, really well. We really think that you know, we want to help you, but you really c could and should raise some, get some VC funding. So then we'll help them with introductions and introduce them to the best VCs, uh, which we know would be very, very interested in working with them. And in that case, when you're, you know, the company has raised first debt and then they're looking to raise equity, like what kind of a profile of a company would you recommend for that? What do you mean? It's like, you know, you see a company, they're doing amazing, and you're like, actually, I think you should probably talk to some VCs. What, what kind of a company would, would be right for that, do you think? Well, Are they like growing super fast? Or exactly. Like, okay. I, th I think, you know, we know. We know what works, right? I think the beauty of our company, of our business is yeah. we are looking now at like tens of thousands of businesses every year. And like we can categorize them, benchmark them versus each other. And we know what's best in, what's best in class, right. uh, what, what's average. 
And for the best in class companies, we want to make sure they are even bigger. Like, you know, we want to, we really are fully f founder friendly. Even if we were to lose the business, we do want to make sure that we are the ones who made the introduction and we want the client to succeed because we know that it will pay back in the long term. So when we see this type of client, uh, we will tell them, hey, we're going to keep funding you, but if you want a VCs, we know five, 10 funds who will be very, very interested in talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want the intro? And very often they say yes. Interesting. Do you ever get any questions from founders um, when they're considering you versus maybe going and raising more traditional VC funding around like brands? You know, of course, if you partner with a VC, there's like a lot of brand that that can bring to you, and you ha you have the the big headline in Sifted yeah, about yeah. raising for su from such and such VC. How do you like talk to founders about that that aspects of fundraising? You know, it's very funny. We had some customers who actually announced that they took money from us. You know, as a part of the press release, they said, hey, we uh, raised this round, and on top of this, we got X and X of money of, of uh, funding from, from Uncapped. Uh, I think, you know, we are very, um, we are not for everyone. We really work with the best companies, and, you know, to work with us, you need to have a solid business, solid unit economics because we take much more risk than VC funding. Uh, like, we know, we make much less money and we can't afford to lose. So if you take funding from us, it's actually a very, very strong signal um, to the market. Um, so our, our you know, portfolio companies raised from the, from the best funds uh, um, across. I also think that the market is changing, you know, like founders, you know, Tiger shows that fi Founders don't care about VCs so much. You know, money is money. They just want to make sure they get funding and they keep on growing their business. VCs, you know, are great. And I think everyone loves to announce the round. At the end of the day, in reality, it's not a positive news. You just sold half of your, like, part of a company. It's, you know, maybe it's not something to be really, really happy about. Interesting, interesting take on that. Um, and, and why more generally, like you, you mentioned Tiger and that there's like diversification in VC and strategies and fundraising that we're seeing. Why do you think that more founders are interested in these kinds of alternative financing methods? Um, I think f uh, founders are realizing that managing the cap table is more and more important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, these crazy rounds are actually doing something, changing the market in a very interesting way. The best companies are able to raise at amazing valuations, but if you look at the number of uh, investments, it's actually slightly decreasing, and this means that these average companies or, or other founders are actually struggling even more, because VCs are looking for, you know, next Hopin, or next remote.com, or, you know, next, next Decacorn and everyone else is struggling. So founders are realizing, realizing that, and they know that they have to be much more prudent uh, with their shares, they really have to avoid the dilution, and they're looking for the smarter ways to, to, to build their business. And you know, two years ago, they didn't have any options, and now finally they can talk to us. Well, what changed? Like we're seeing so many companies like you guys like emerging right now. Is there something like behind other than, you know, I don't know, people looking for the market itself maturing and expanding? Is there anything else behind yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's a great why, why now question. And it comes to, I think, two factors or three. Um, first of all, market size. I think, you know, five years ago, frankly, there was just not enough companies um, to lend to to make it viable business model. Yeah. I think if we started then, I don't think we would be able to scale to one-fifth of what we are right now. Okay. Secondly, it's about the technology. Open banking, you know, open APIs. Um, there's proliferation of data now, and it finally allows to make underwriting fast and smooth and efficient mm -hmm. and allows us to scale the business. Mm -hmm. And I think third thing is a very slight change in a VC mindset to to lending businesses. Okay. I think, you know, a couple years ago, if you had a lending business like ours, it was very, very difficult to get funding from VCs ourselves. Yeah. And then, you know, Klarna and other buy now pay later companies and other success, successful com companies showed that actually you can make money on lending. And finally, VCs are again interested in giving capital to like, companies like us. Interesting, definitely. And so, what do you think about? There's also like kind of the other side, which is that you see, do see some VCs, actually, VCs moving into this space themselves. So I'm thinking about like General Catalyst that announced, you know, earlier this year that they're going to have a fund where they're going to buy future revenue of startups, yeah. right? So, what do you think of the potential for VCs moving into this space as well and becoming competitors to you? 
Huh, you know, I genuinely think they underestimate how hard it is to build this company. Like, you know, um, we are almost 100 people right now. Um, I think if you have a small team of, of investment professionals, you will never be able to match the product of ours, like in terms of the quality, speed, execution, the capital, and you know, doing all these needs. I think people think, people underestimate how hard it is uh, to build this business and how hard it is to really deliver outstanding value proposition to the customers. Mm. Um, so I think they're all up for a huge disappointment when they realized what are they up to. And I think they'll be much better off just giving capital to us. <laughs> Very bullish. I like it. So my next question would be around like what keeps you up at night? What's the thing that concerns you or, or worries you, whether that's about external competition or changes in the market or just scaling your own business? Ah, good question. I think, you know, like everyone, I think I'm most worried about the general macro environment. I think, you know, with interest rates changing and, you know, everyone knows that the stock market is crazy and everyone is looking for this big crash, but no one knows when it will happen. You know, some people are, for last 10 years, are you know, saying, oh, tech stocks are too high, we're going to have a crash. And they keep doubling and doubling. Um, but I think the day of reckoning will come one day. And this is the day when us and everyone else might wake up in a very difficult position. Yeah. So, you know, we have to make sure that our company is ready for this and our clients are ready for this and we can support them through, through this. Right. You know, we are also very impacted by um, big trends like COVID and vaccination and changes. Like in summer, um, there was a definite like decrease in the lockdowns and people started to go on holidays. And in our data, we saw a huge decrease in the revenue across all e-commerce sector. Interesting. And e-commerce yeah. is, you know, 80% of our business. So, like, for two months, it was really, really scary. So these big macro trends with lockdowns or lack of lockdowns actually has a huge impact on companies like ours. Interesting. And so what's next for you guys? You talked a little bit about your vision and being, like, the neobank for, for startups and for scale-ups. Um, what else is there? What's your expansion plans? Yeah, I think... Building a new bank, I think we started as a lending business, but I think the startups need the better operating system uh, to run their company. I think today there is no real banking product for tech companies. I think there is Silicon Valley Bank with, frankly, very average product offering. You know, we are a customer, and it's it's so painful to even open the bank account. Um, and I think this is what we want to change. We want the startups to have the best experience in opening a bank account, getting funding, managing, the, managing their business, paying invoices, having a credit card for startups, basically having one-stop shop to fulfill all their financial needs. So this is what we're building and this is what, what we're launching in the next quarter. Amazing. And so geographically, where do you want to focus on next? Well. The big areas of focus for us right now is both Germany and the US. Uh, I think this is, you know, we are very strong in the UK. I think, you know, we are the biggest uh, lender for startups in the UK. And I think next ambition for us is to conquer uh, these two, two next big markets. Amazing, amazing. And I also, like, you know, in terms of funding as well, I think it's kind of interesting maybe to hear about your experience as a company that lends out to startups, but you've also raised funding yourself. Like, how does that feel? <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a very interesting discussion for investors, right? Because, you know, some of them are asking you, oh, are you, are you trying to kill my, biz kill my business? Right. Uh, you know, how are you changing the game, you know? Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the best investors know that to make money, you have to disrupt yourself. Right. And I think we are the, you know, the next generation of disruption in the, in the ecosystem. So I think if you want to diversify your business, I think this is the safe bet to, uh, to hedge yourself. Yeah, definitely. It feels a little bit about like when Sifted raised money and we write about startups raising money, about like super meta. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> definitely. Well, thank you so much for all of this. I want to kind of leave everyone with some th simple takeaways, especially the founders or operators in the audience with some simple takeaways like what they can remember. So if you were talking to a founder and you were going to give them three things that they should remember about revenue backed finance, what should they remember? What are those three things? I think, first of all, um, it's no dilution. So you don't give up any equity. Secondly, 
Um, it's very fast. You can get funding in you know, 24 hours. Um, and thirdly, uncapped is the best. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. I feel like I've learned a lot. And There's one more surprise we had. What? There's one more surprise we had. There's one more surprise, yeah. Yeah, okay. so uh, for everyone here, uh, we have a stand somewhere over there, and we have a special promotion for Slash attendees. Uh, if you would like to try out our product, we are offering up to 50,000 of capital for marketing without any fees. So you can boost up your marketing spend uh, for the next couple months without any fees. Amazing. <laughs> Someone's excited. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Twitter. Thank you so much. It was amazing chatting with you. Thanks.